All right, we're back in the book of Revelation and looking at the seven churches of Revelation. Last week we looked at Ephesus and the church that uh, God commended for their good works. They were orthodox. They didn't bow to false teachings. They hated the works of the Nicolaitans, which were sinful things. And uh, the, the thing that he said, though I have this against you, was that they had abandoned the love they first had for God. In other words, their love for God was not the same as it was in the beginning. He calls them back to that. Uh, we're going to look uh, this morning in Revelation chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and start turning there in your Bible. Revelation chapter 2, uh, beginning uh, at verse 8. Uh, we'll pick up with the second church, which is the church of Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna was a city that was a large city for its time. It was, it was The population of Smyrna was 100,000 people or so, uh, archaeologists believe. It was about 35 miles from Ephesus. And it was called the crown city or the flower of Asia. Its motto was, first in Asia, in size and beauty. But it wasn't a beautiful situation for Christians. In fact, it was just the opposite of beautiful. It was a very difficult situation for Christians. And from the time that God uh, gave a revelation to John and he wrote it down for what we, what we read from uh, today uh, until about 312 A.D., so uh, over, over 200 years, um, you have intense persecution of the Christians that lived in Smyrna especially. And uh, now when we, th this is not persecution like we think of persecution in our context culturally where if somebody snickers at you or makes fun of you or whatever, that's persecution. No, 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 this was physical harm, this was potential death, this was imprisonment, this was families being split up, this was loss of income, this was, this was very significant persecution that was going on. And uh, another thing to note about Smyrna, we'll read it in just a moment, but, but there, it's unique from all the other seven churches that are addressed because they, uh, the church in Smyrna is only commended. It's not rebuked. Every other church is corrected or rebuked because of something. So, for example, last week in Ephesus, we talked about he, he rebuked them. He said, I have this against you that you've lost the love. You've abandoned, I'm sorry, abandoned or left the love you had in the beginning. And they're, they're corrected or they're rebuked. He says, I have this against you. But that's not true in the section that he writes to the church in Smyrna. Now, the other churches, we'll get to them in later weeks, but they're all corrected for something. This is the only church that isn't. You know what that tells me? A church that's persecuted, but it's doing, doing no, nothing wrong that needs to be corrected. That tells me that you can believe right, you can do right, you can act right, you can think right, you can have right relationships with other people and with God, and you can do everything in obedience and submission to the Lord, and you can still suffer. Now, that flies in the face of a lot of uh, uh, TV evangelists and a lot of, of kind of a, almost a folk theology today of, uh, well, if you, if you uh, really have enough faith, you'll never be sick. Well, that's, that's just not true. That's not a biblical truth. It's not true. And, uh, and in fact, uh, just the opposite is true. Uh, and we'll get into it in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of scripture where, where, where God's people are warned. There's going to be trials. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be hardships. Don't be surprised by these things. It will happen. He didn't say if it happens. He says when it happens. And so this church in Smyrna is doing everything right. And they're dealing with the difficulty. Let's read this morning, Revelation chapter 2. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God out of reverence for what God has to speak to us today through His Word. Revelation chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 8 in Scripture. The Bible says this, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, 
We give you thanks for this word today that you have for us, God, and we invite your spirit to speak to us, Lord. May we be shaped not by the, the, the moving trends of the culture around us, but may, Lord, we be shaped and transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word and by your Holy Spirit. We ask that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Verse 8, he says, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Now, this is the description of, of Christ here, or of Jesus uh, in particular uh, here. And uh, uh, just make note that these descriptions, uh, they're, they're always a little bit different with the seven churches. Uh, but they are intentional. They have something to do. There's a quality about God, a description of God that is pertinent for the, these, each of these churches' situations that they're facing. What, what's Smyrna facing? They're facing the tribulation. They're facing the difficulty. They're facing hardship. And so he says, this is the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. The first and last. That's fitting for those that are in the midst of persecution. It's hard to... It's hard to believe in the middle of the hardship that you're going through that God is bigger than your problems. But you can write it down. You can take it to the bank. God is, was here before your problem started, and he'll be there long after your problem is long and gone because God is bigger than your problems. Hallelujah. Know this. He had the first word. He's going to have the last word, praise the Lord. He was the first one here. He'll be the last one to leave. He started things with creation. He'll finish them with judgment. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A and the Z. He started it all. He'll finish it all. He's the beginning and the end. He is the welcome and he is the amen, praise the Lord. He is all these things. It's kind of like, uh, he's kind of saying like what my mother used to say to me. Now, this was more of a disciplinary thing for her. But she said, you know what? I brought you into this world, and I can, yeah, I can take you out of this world. It's like your mama told you that too, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but that's the idea. That's what God's saying. But he's not saying it uh, toward, toward the people of Smyrna. He's letting them know this is to your problems. This is to the conflict that you're facing. This is to those things that are opposing you spiritually and maybe even physically and every other way. I, will, I was here long before those things arose, and I'll be around long afterward. I am the consistent factor in your life. So church at Smyrna, yes, you're going through hardship. Yes, you are persecuted, but God will be there through it all. He says, who died and came to life. What's that referencing? It's the resurrection. Hey, I want you to know something. There's a lot of people I don't care to be on my side. I don't necessarily want them with me and I'm, when I'm in a fix, but there are some, and I want the people with the power. And he says, I am the resurrection, the one who died and has come back to life. Praise the Lord. I want the God of resurrection power to be in my corner. I want that God to be behind me, moving in my life, working through me, uh, seeing me through the difficulties that we're facing. Uh, scripture uh, makes lots of reference that even the enemy of death, and Paul writes to the church at Corinth in chapter 15. He says, where, O oh death, is your sting? Where's your power? You don't have what you used to have. Now, there's a lot of people who live in fear of death. But I want you to know something as one who has been born again by the, by the, of the Spirit of God, who's walking with God in the fullness of relationship and in righteousness and in holiness. I want you to know something. You don't even have to fear death. You may be uncertain about what it's going to feel like, when it's going to take place. There's a lot of uncertainty maybe surrounding it. But I want you to know something. You don't have to live in fear of death when you're walking with God. You can know that the one who was dead but is now alive is walking with you and that same resurrection power is moving in your life Christians of Smyrna hear this even if this persecution leads to your death you be faithful unto death because we serve a God of resurrection power you'll get the crown of life praise be to God and the Romans certainly tried to stamp it out do you know everywhere the church is persecuted it grows more in fact, the United States, where we have the most freedoms of any, any, any Christian in any time almost, in any place in the world, uh, we have all kinds of freedoms to worship the Lord, to live for Him, and to serve Him. And 
and to honor him. And with all those freedoms, you know, the church in the United States is, is dwindling. In other words, it's in decline. Everyone's saying, oh, no, less people are going to church now and, and all these kinds of things. But I want you to know something. That's because we're not dealing with persecution. But I'll tell you, there will come a day when the church, even the United States, is going to have to deal with persecution. And don't be afraid of it. Don't live in fear of it. No, I don't want to be persecuted either. But don't live in fear of it because when that day comes, I want you to know something. There's going to be a revival in the land. God's going to move afresh and anew, even in the midst of persecution. And this is what's going on in Smyrna, this city of, of around 100,000 people, a huge city of its time. There's revival taking place in a church, even though the people are persecuted, even though there are some who would want to stamp them out. Praise the Lord. These people were willing to pay the price. Verse 9 uh, God speaking to them says I know your tribulation and your poverty but you're rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, this word tribulation is an umbrella term for persecution of all kinds but the word tribulation literally means pressure. In other words they were living with the day to day pressure. They were dealing with ongoing resistance toward their walk with God. There's, you know, we think resistance is because we get too busy. No, that's just because you don't make time. You will make time for what you care most about. Do you hear what I'm saying? You will always make time for the things that matter most to you. You'll make time for those things. And, and there's tribulation. That these people are dealing with pressure. We don't, we don't really fully comprehend or we don't understand. They were willing to pay the price to be faithful to Jesus Christ. It might have affected them economically or financially because they were in prison. You can't run a business from prison. You can't plant your crops when you're in prison. Uh, you can't pay your bills if you keep getting fined. You can't, go, you can't go to work if they've cut your hand or your foot off because of, uh, you're serving the Lord or whatever the case may be. And so it's affected them. But Jesus said, hey, even though you're, you're, you know, you're poor, you know, you're dealing with poverty now, you're suffering. Because you're dealing with the tribulation and the pressure that, the, that, the, that Smyrna and uh, the government or the people and the culture is putting on you. You're, you're poor. But he says, but I know you are rich. You have what counts. You have what really matters. You have it all. What, I'm, what he's trying to say here is, hey, I don't care how much money you've got in the bank. If you've got all the money in the bank, but you don't know what it means to consistently hold to Jesus Christ and walk with him in life, you know what real poverty is. And you might not have anything in your bank again. Your car might be some beat up clunker that's barely running you don't know how you're going to pay your electric bill sometime and you might be uh, going through difficulties in those kinds of ways but if you are in Christ if you are living in obedience to him you have wealth the world does not understand the world could never know you can have nothing but you can have more than Bill Gates you can have nothing and, and you can have more than all the famous people of the world praise God there is something enriching about knowing and walking with Jesus. Praise the Lord. I don't, I don't want to live the life of people I see around me. Oh, so many people want to dress and act and live like these Hollywood stars. And, and they're, they're dealing with brokenness and broken marriages. And they can't stay married for any amount of time. And broken family and drug addictions. And the suicide rate among the wealthy like them and the famous is so much higher than the average person and why do we keep gravitating toward that life why do we keep wanting what they've got they don't have anything they are living out of their own spiritual poverty but we that are in Christ Jesus have richness and fullness that the world may not understand but they desperately need they desperately need and I want something that's real and lasting we who are who have Christ are rich in him uh, and then he said they're even standing by their religious brothers. There's some, he said, you know, there, there's some that, that claim to, 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 to be of the, uh, Jews, and, and, uh, but they're really a synagogue of Satan. Man, that's a strong, that's strong language. And he's saying, hey, you're going to be attacked by people. Let me tell you something. When you get serious about God, there's going to be even some people, maybe in the church. Lord, help us. Not to, may it not be us. Uh, but there's going to be some people even who are in the church who claim to be Christian who are going to be resistant to you. Don't go all out. Don't be too radical. Sometimes it's because if you are living beyond where they're living, it puts them in a place of conviction. The Spirit starts to work in their life, and they're like, oh, man, 
I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable that this person is so passionate and so living it out, even though they're dealing with all the pressures from it. And so he's saying, you don't, don't worry about them. Don't listen to them. You just keep on enduring them. And don't even fear, he said, what you are about to suffer. Don't fear it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Christians who spend too much time in life fearing things that may never happen anyway. And he said, don't fear the persecution. Because when you fear it, it becomes a focal point in your life. The things that you fear become central to your life. They always do, because it shapes patterns of your life. If you're afraid of the dark, for example, I remember when I was a kid, I was afraid of the dark. If you're afraid of the dark, guess what? It's going to affect when you're out walking and it gets to be evening, it gets to be a little darker, or things that have... And, and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying, don't fear this persecution or it will become central to your life. It'll become the focus of your life. This is not something foreign either uh, because First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he, he, he tells the believers, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Don't let it throw you off your game. You be consistent with the Lord. 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Don't be surprised. Well, I thought when I began to serve the Lord, everything would go right. Everything would be fine. Well, you thought wrong. And here it is. He says, don't be surprised when things go wrong in your life. Don't be surprised when difficulties come. They're going to come. What makes us different is not the circumstances that we have to face all the time as Christians because the, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. These things happen to the good people as well as bad people. But what makes us different is that we are foundation on something that is lasting and sure and true and eternal. That is Jesus Christ our Lord. So, Paul writes to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Hallelujah. Sounds really familiar to verse 10 where we read, where he says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the real wealth right there. We must be faithful to the Lord. We must be faithful to His Word. We must be faithful to the body of Christ. We must be faithful to the commission that Jesus gave to us before He ascended back into heaven. Of go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We've got to be faithful to these things. We're running a race and we're going to have opposition, but we're not going to stop. And then verse 11, he says, The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Not be hurt by the second death. Now, now think again. These, these believers were facing death. And it's like, hey, you might have to face death. You might have to travel through that, that, that journey, through that valley of, of the shadow of death. You might have to go through that valley. And it might be sooner than you anticipate. And it may be that you, your life ends through, uh, because of unnatural things that take place. Not because you get old and sick and die, but because uh, you stand for the faith. And you might face those kind of things. But if you are faithful, I want you to know the second death is going to harm you. What's the second death? The second death is hell. After this life is over, oftentimes in the Re Revelation, other places, hell is referred to as a second death. They're cast into the sea of fire where they experience the second death. And what he's saying is, hey, you know this. If you're faithful and true, no matter how hard this life gets, if you're faithful and true, you'll be with Jesus in heaven one day. The one who is dead but is now alive, you'll be with him. He's the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. You'll be with him. In other words, church, they can take your wealth. They can take away your family. They can take away your job. They can take away your house. They can take away your car. They can take away everything that you own. They can take away all kinds of things, your reputation and uh, all the things, your friends. Everything can be stripped down away from you. But there's one thing that no one can take away, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship is what really makes you wealthy. So invest in it. Focus on it. Keep it at the center of your life. You can take away everything else, but you can't take away Jesus from me. Amen. We used to sing a lot of songs, more, more often songs about getting to heaven one day. You remember the song, When We All Get to Heaven? 
when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Yeah, praise the Lord. Because we're excited. Now, what I'm afraid of is in the time in which we live, man, I've got a lazy boy now. I'm not like the church in Smyrna. I'm not suffering. I'm not, there's no persecution. Nobody's threatening my life because I'm serving. And I've got a lazy boy. I'm not really interested in going to heaven because I've got my chips and my TV and my lazy boy, and I've got everything I need right here and right now. And what, what he's saying is then maybe you're missing what was of real value in your existence because that ain't your lazy boy. It's not your comfort. It's not the ease of life. It's not the luxuries that we have all around us or the, the blessing of material things that maybe even God has given to us. But the real wealth of life is knowing the resurrection in the life. The real wealth of life. You want to be rich. You want to be more wealthy than everybody else in the world. And the riches of the Forbes of 100 most rich people. Then know Jesus Christ in his fullness and know what he desires to do on your life. And so I challenge you today. Press on. Press on toward the prize. You can make it through the difficulty. You can make it through the hardship. You can make it through the things that are going on in life if you hold to Jesus Christ as the anchor of your soul and you'll come, on, come through it, not as people of poverty, spiritual poverty, but of people that have the assurance of the wealth of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. That's worth having. Would you stand with me today? Would you stand?